Welcome to Thelma FM's Life Story Podcast. In this two-part episode, we are joined by Hibs legend Mickey Weir. The first instalment takes Mickey from growing up in Granton and Clermiston, through school days and inspirational coaches at St Augustine's, to playing for Portobello Thistle in his early days at Hibs. From 7-0 wins and 7-0 defeats, to being launched into the first team and the events that led to a transfer to Luton Town. We hope you'll enjoy the first part of Mickey's journey. Well, Mickey, a very warm welcome to Life Stories. Let's go right back to the start. The big sporting event of 1966 was obviously at the birth of Mickey Weir. What are your earliest memories? Earliest memories were... I was brought up in... I was very young. I started off in Granton. Me and my family brought up in Granton. A one-bedroom flat with five of us, plus my mum and dad, so it was not the greatest. But great, great times, obviously. It was difficult for mum and dad. He had absolutely nothing, to be honest, you know. Uh, hard working, very hard working. But then we moved to West Pilton for a, a number of years, where my dad... We had to go there because my dad was looking for a bigger house, you know, so we yeah. had to go and stay with our grandparents in Pilton for a number of years. I think it was two and a half years. I would need to look back at that, but it was, it was great memories. My granddad and my gran were very, very uh, influential in the way I led my life, you know, because yeah. they were, my granda especially, because my granda was trying to all, all times keep me off the street, keep me on the street and narrow, and achieved that. But as I say, it was, uh, it was tough, you know, it was yeah. tough when I was younger, it brought up in that kind of area, but a lot of good memories, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I'd even been brought up in what's looked on as a Disadvantaged area. As a kid, you don't really know, do you? No, no, you know? I don't mind. It was, you just it was the same life. for everyone. Yeah. You know, I was safe yeah. for everyone. But I was very fortunate. I had good parenting. I had the, as I say, my granda and my grand were very good to me. So, and they had the, the greatest. They brought all the values to me as a young person. You know. And where did you hang about as a wee boy then? Mostly in West Pilton, you know. But when we moved to Clermiston, my mum and dad we got a house in Clermiston after that. So, so when I went to Clermiston, it was obviously just round about that area from school. I still came down to see my friends who I knew at West Pilton it was a crazy thing because I actually had the pigeons in, in West Pilton my granddad got the pigeons for me to basically keep me keep me off the streets yeah. so when I moved to Clermiston I had to keep coming down on the bus to fly yeah. the birds and after school and all that type of stuff in the summer but most of my days were spent at the pigeon hut I'll be honest when I was younger yeah. at the pigeon hut and then so was that on the roof of the building no, we, had our, we had our own pigeon hut my granddad bought uh, my, my dad built a pigeon hut for us so and I was there all the time and I spent hours upon hours uh, from early in the summer and summer holidays I would be out there for 8 o'clock in the morning till dark you know yeah. I was there all day just loved it it was very my haven that was my haven as a young boy you know so I yeah. was and I was just got infatuated with him I wasn't there, like it was a great thing as I say because it did keep it kept me out of trouble you know it kept me out yeah. of trouble there's a connection with Duncan Ferguson loved these pigeons as yeah, well I think didn't yeah racing pigeon man yeah well, I was a, we were a different bit pigeons were pigeons but uh, ours was the the fancy pigeons what we call the horsemen which were which was a big it still is big not as big as what it was then and then housing schemes in Edinburgh everybody had them and did you, do you have favourites then, Mickey, or was it just that you'd love being around the birds, or did they have names and you had? No, to... they had. It was, it was it was a difficult one. I still do that unless you know pigeons, horsemen. Probably people who maybe listen to this. They will understand it was a competition between your birds and other people's birds. You right. know, so yeah. you put out a pigeon to try and catch one of their pigeons. So right. it was like a male versus female. And one would try and attract the other one back to their hut, and that right. that was the, that was a competition. That was a, a sport. But I absolutely loved it. And is that still with you? That interest? yeah, still there. Yeah, interest is still there. My boys got them at the moment, and I don't think I love it. I don't think it ever leaves you, you know, mm-hmm. because it was it was so part, it was so much part of my life when I was younger. I spent hours there, you know, and that yeah. was uh, to my detriment because I was I virtually spent most of my day there, and that's that that was it. I never I never moved from the pigeon hut. I was yeah. just and is it still the same hut? Yeah, same hut. Oh, uh, that was, it's not there now. No, it's not, I moved when I moved myself. Uh, I'm still. I've got my own wee pigeon hut now. My my wee laddie got me one, but that one then was that was huge for me in my life at that mm. time. You know, people would maybe look at it and go, "How was that big?" But it was. It was massive because the pigeon world. You've got to know it. You know, it's yeah. like uh, an obsession. It's very much like if you're into music or whatever. But mm. my, my passion at that time was was the pigeons. Yeah, and and your grandparents who initially brought you up was yeah. your were they interested in football? Did they? Were yeah. They my dad, oh, my granddad, my dad, my whole family were all hip supporters, massive yeah. hip supporters. My granddad took me to all the games with my dad, my uncles. We'd meet in the Ducat pub in Edinburgh when I yeah. was younger and they would go down to watch the hubs. But my granddad was a f- huge hip supporter, 
the whole family were just massive hip supporters, yeah. but mainly my granda. He was yeah. he was the start of us all. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah. So, what age would you be when you went to your first game? Oh, you're talking about seven or eight year old. Yeah. Uh, back in those days, you know, Hibs were in Europe, and you know, I can just I've not got a great memory of it, but I just remember playing, standing on the terrace as a wee boy, looking at the big fl- the floodlights. You know, it was yeah. magical to go and look at the your know, Alec Edwards and your Paddy Stantons of this world. Yeah. So would that be famous five time or is that just no? After just that? after that, yeah, yeah it was. But uh, you still hear the stories, and I'm you know my grand yeah. always tell me about the famous five, my dad. So you still hear the stories, but that was my era. Was like Paddy. Stanton, you know, Arkes was Jimmy Aru, Alan Gordon, that type yeah. of things. But it was just magical going to watch the Hibs and Ladies. It was Fuel House, you know, everywhere. Yeah. Was, and getting taken over, getting thrown over the gate, you never paid in, you just yeah. put you over the gate and and you went. It was great. And was that standing on the terrace? Now, would you be putting your granddad's shoulders? Your granddad's shoulders and all that stuff, yeah, because yeah. we used to have a specific place behind the goal, with big floodlights, where we stood. But great, it was fantastic. It was great days to go and watch the Hibs as a young man, you know. And did you continue that throughout your life? Yeah. Going with your granddad and your dad to the games? Yeah, we went to most of the games. But obviously, when I started to play myself on a Saturday, I never really had the time to go and watch, you know. But, and then my granddad, my dad, and that, they would still go and watch the Hibs. But but then, as I got older, I started to play myself. I kind of drifted away from watching them, mainly because I was playing football myself, you know, but I, still, I was still a bit, huge hip supporter. So, to rewind back a wee bit, what are your memories of that first house you grew up in, Mickey? If you close your eyes and you mm. walk around that house, apart from the pigeon hut, what, what do you remember about the house? Just the laughs, you yeah. know, the laughs. And my grandad was, a, he was a, such a character. And the fun that we used to have as a young man, my family... But it was it was tough, you know. But we, we never we never I never ever looked at it as being tough, you know. But I just remember the fun that we used to have at New Year. And back in those days, the Hogmanay was huge, you know, and there would be big parties all the time and that type of stuff. So great memories. But it was a warmth, really warm upbringing. My granddad, my grand, and my mum and dad. You know, it was a lot of us to stay in one house. You know, that yeah. was a lot. But you also got my uncles coming round with mm. their children. So they were all my cousins. New Year and and Christmas was massive and these days New Year was huge you know yeah. everybody we used to call it for footing back yeah. in the day you know so yeah. you got other families coming in here it's a lot bigger you know, in Christmas in those big, days, yeah, yeah it was massive and they, uh, you got a lot of families that came in all your friends would come round so you were looking about oh, you are talking about 30, 40 maybe more in, in the rooms and in the, yeah. oh, in the kitchen and in the drinking and it was just partying and partying mm-hmm. some of the days some of the parties were going for days and weeks yeah. the days of folks standing up and doing a turn do you have folks singing, or? singing. Yeah. you'd have to do it when yeah. you were young you know <laughs> granddad would say or my dad would say right it's your turn to get up and sing or you'd have yeah. to I used to be into the drunk I used to like the drums so I would have biscuit tins and things like that yeah. so you know, yeah you had to do your turns it was great It's uh, it was something that I don't you never ever see that again but people yeah. would not believe the things that used to go on you know dancing and and somebody would maybe bring a, a guitar and they'd start singing songs and then obviously the Hibs songs started coming out because yeah. most of them were all Hibs supporters and then you got Hearts supporters in amongst it but it was great times it, it was never any kind of trouble when it came to that but my, it was really I loved it I absolutely loved it and growing up food wise did you have a favourite was there something your grand grand would cook for you Oh dear, uh, soup, that's all we had yeah. and it, it, It's true, people don't believe it But we were brought up in, in soup and bread yeah. You know, a lot of it was soup and bread Tripe was massive in these People look at it and, oh, how do you eat tripe? I absolutely <laughs> loved it, still to this day love it Can't yeah. really get it, what you used to be able to get But people would spend hours My granddad would spend hours putting tripe on You know, cleaning it and then you know, washing it all, and the old older people would understand it. And they would put potatoes in it, vegetables in mm-hmm. it, and it was just it took all day. But I always remember the smell. The smell was the worst part, you know, mm-hmm. all the way all the way through the house. But yeah, tripe and soup, bread. That was the way you were brought up in these days. Yeah. Corn beef, maybe a wee bit of that. That was that was. To be honest, that was about it. You know, that was mm-hmm. the type of thing. But we were never ever struggled for food, and we never ever struggled for clothing. You know, you got the best you could possibly you could afford at that time. And your earliest friendships, Mickey? Who were your first mates that come to mind? Oh, I had a lot of them. I had a lot of them. Mainly at school when I went to school, yeah, had a few boys about the the, the neighbourhood. You know, I like say Paul McLennan and that who was at my school. Guys that I played football with. You know, because I went to play with Pilton Sporting Club, so they then became my friends. You know, mm. boys like uh, Alfie King, Brian Haston, John Welsh. Maybe some of these people would maybe listen to this part. These type of guys, they were all my friends. You know, because yeah. I played football with them. But then when I went to my went to the Pigeon Hut, that was mainly. Guys that I flew the birds way, like mm. Paul McLaren and these type of guys, and then I knew the whole 
pigeon community. I was still young, very young, but they were the ones that really, as I got a wee bit older, you obviously move on to a different group of friends as you went mm-hmm. to school, but they were mainly the ones when I was younger. And when I moved to Clermeson, I had a couple of boys that were at my school, Gregory Mann, who was a good friend of mine. He unfortunately died at a young man, he died a young man, he took a, he had a tumour in his brain. So that was a bit of a loss to me as a young yeah. person, that was, because I was very close to him. Mm, how old were you then? Uh, I'm looking at, 12 year old 12, 13 year old I'm not the greatest for Mm. remembering that was a big hit for me because Gregory was a person who he suffered from he had a stutter at the time Mm. you know and I kind of felt quite sorry for him it was a horrible thing to do but he took a wee bit of bullying and that because that kids can be cruel you know and I took a really good liking to him and I'd never ever and still to this day I never liked I, I hated bullying yeah. You know, I hated people being bullied. So he was a friend of mine, and b- basically because he was, I felt sorry for him at first, and then he became a really good friend. But when I lost him, it just came out the blue, and that was quite a tough one for me to take at that mm. time. You know, so these type of boys. I think any of that's probably the the first big loss of your life, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's no. right. Yeah, and I never even, I never, I couldn't bring myself to go to his funeral. I never mm. went my family went and they represented me it was just a hard hit and I was never that type of person I, I didn't like a uh, loss I'm still like that today I didn't like yeah. to see people but that was a big hit for me and that, that kind of that was tough on me at that time you know so going back you mentioned there the Pilton Sporting Club where, where was your first kind of brush with organised football was there a primary school team where you were yeah it was primary school Fox Cover in Edinburgh and then Pilton Sporting Club was the one that I got asked to go along actually mm. it, was, it was a weird one because I was there again it's as I said earlier, I was flying my pigeons and one of my friends knocked on the door and said, how would you fancy coming playing for us? They were running out of, we've not got players. So I went, ah, uh, yeah. So I went along. I started playing with it, enjoyed it. When I was younger, at that age, it was very natural. Football was yeah. very natural to me at that time. You mm. know, it wasn't like, a, I used to just walk on a football field and everything was natural. You know, mm. with any coaching or anything like that, it was very natural at that time. So then I started to enjoy it and yeah. then I went along to play with them. And then with my school, I started to play with my school and I loved it, Fox Covert School. So that was the start of it being part of my, but the Pilton Sporting Club, was, as I say, my friends. And there were some characters in that club. <laughs> it was Unbelievable, but that was me. That was me start to to play organised football. And your first memories of football going back before that was that just kicking the ball about with your granddad in the back garden yeah, just or the in house the, in the back, you know, in the back garden. Never ever got involved with football clubs at that as a young age. But my granddad would take me and my dad. But a lot of it was my brothers because I used to play football against my brothers mm-hmm. in the garden, and it was like World War Three. The older brothers, just, my older brothers, yeah. and my younger one, Mark, who's younger than me. But it was like a. It was full on. It was they obviously got you got sort of street games, play street against street in these days. But it was it was tough, you know, you're talking about you're playing you maybe nine year old playing against fourteen year olds and fifteen year olds and kicking lots yeah. at you, you know, and it was just like but when I played my brothers, we were so competitive. Oh yes. We're yeah. still like that today. So if you had played a wee game in the in the garden, somebody one would go and go and it one V one it used to be an absolute war. And I hated getting beat at anything. I thought mm. that like that today and I think that drove me I think that was the thing that really I had over a lot of people and uh, maybe never had the stature but I, I absolutely despised losing anything especially football and then obviously if you got beat they would rub wind you up <laughs> you go home and if you went into the, into the room they would wind you up ah, I'll beat you we won and that type of stuff and it used to really annoy me you know? so that yeah. was the, story, the beginning but back in those days it was it was like street against street and then mm-hmm. school against school and football was everywhere you know I played football from 8 o'clock in the morning to 9 o'clock at night once I got the taste of football and I was away you know I think that's kind of missing from today's footballers education you know I think yeah. my wee boy will play with kids of his own age yeah. play organised football against maybe a year above or but it never when we were growing up you were playing against boys five six years older yeah, so right. much bigger so much yeah. faster and stronger you know yeah. and that's just gone i think that, that was part. your learning that was your learning part part of it you know because people remember in those days it was like 15 20 aside in craig royston park we used to play at craig royston park and then at clermeson that was just part of it you know you just mm-hmm. you just turned up and somebody would say right you play for me and you play for that team you play for that team take-ons we called them in the days just a take-on mm-hmm. the, the word would get out as a take-on at you know Craig Royston Park so you go down there and play mm-hmm. but it was tough you know yeah. it was tough you would get kicked up and down the place and but you learnt so much you knew you learnt how to avoid tackles you knew learnt, you know this type yeah. of stuff and you learnt to look after yourself but mm-hmm. if you didn't you, would, you wouldn't survive you know because you're playing against older guys so that was it that was my learning but I would never change I wouldn't change it for anything you know yeah. I think it was a 
great upbringing for myself and lots of other players. It's no time in the ball in those days no either. Time, was no, it? that was just twenty a side game. That was the beginning of the high press. Wasn't <laughs> yeah, it? That's it was like, oh dear, yeah, it was great. Maybe at the time you didn't realise it, but you were learning so much. You know, you ride in tackles, you know, and, and even you got coached by players. People beside you would coach you. They would tell you, you know, you're holding on to the ball too much, or you need to pass it, or you know, take them on that type of stuff. That was your learning. That was yeah. football. And you mentioned your brothers. Did you get on well with your brothers? Yeah, on? I still do. Yeah, my brothers. How were many great. have you got? I've got three brothers and yeah I got on great we, we were a very tight family we were very yeah. still like that uh, my sister I've got my sister Yvonne I better mention her she'll not be happy <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're a very very close family still are today and but we had it was a downs like everything else we'd squabble yeah. and fight like brothers do you know but they were always supportive of me especially when I started to play football they were very proud and supportive of me so because mm. they, they were all hub supporters and for their brother to play for the hubs was massive for them you know and did they dabble in it themselves did they yeah my brother was they were all good players you know brother Raymond he was he was probably the toughest one at them all but I could just remember playing against him and they used to just no prisoners just kick lumps at you but he had a drive about him Chris was very skillful very mm. skillful and Mark played at a really good level of football junior level as well so they all had ability you know they had some type of ability and everybody finds a level don't they, they yeah. play, but my brothers and that maybe could have played at a better level but it's like everything you know the dedication side of it I kind of mm. maybe let one or two of them down you know because mm. they were the, my brother liked a drink here and there so but in terms of talent no they were all they all had a, a part of them that could play football yeah and you mentioned a couple of folk going to see Hibs but who, who were your earliest football heroes in those days Early on was as a Hibs supporter I loved Alec Edwards Alec Edwards was my hero I liked watching him just simply because he used to take the corner kicks I remember him taking the corner kicks and I'd go down and stand and watch him with it and look at him taking a corner kick so I liked Jimmy Arook because I was brought up beside Jimmy Arook in Clermiston so he was a hero of mine a lot of them mainly just the Hibs team you know wasn't it Alec Edwards was the one I looked at because just basically basically because he used to take the corner kicks and the throw-ins or whatever it mm-hmm. may be and he'd be up beside us at the fence so I'd run all the way down back in the days yeah, you could run right down to the corner flag if they were taking a corner that type of stuff yeah yeah, he was the one that I looked up to yeah. he was yeah. the one I looked at just exciting being that close to yeah, the was that, was yeah. that was that uh, I suppose young young kids today will get the same feeling when they go and see their players the, the heroes playing you know and so we've got football growing up we've got football and the pigeons were you in any sort of youth organisations did you have any Cubs scouts any no, of that kind I of never, stuff I think I tried Cubs I think I tried Cubs but I didn't go well I don't know why <laughs> I came away from it because I, I, I don't know why it was but I did try it my mum and dad did try me try things with us you know to make realise but I was just obsessed with it as I say my pigeons and things like that were more important to me than trying to be and I liked my music you know I liked a bit of music and that but I wasn't a, I wasn't any organisations I used to go to there was a, a club in West Pilton at the time called the Triangle Club which was just a hut guys who come for that era remember it and I used to go down there it was like a youth club type thing you know and yeah. I'd go down and watch people playing in a band or whatever it may be and dancing you got a lot of Northern Soul dancing type things yeah. or whatever it was I used to go down there with my friends that was about it but never I never really got involved in organisations as such you know apart from football and any other sports were you ever into any other sports at all no really I wasn't a golf man or anything like that I just liked football and I could play most of it snooker I liked a bit of snooker that type of thing but yeah. I was never I was never in, enthralled in anything big sport rather, other than football you know that was uh, the one that I really enjoyed playing so mm-hmm. tried them all you know but try them all badly tennis <laughs> these type of things but it was always the summer and the winter when it was summer yeah. you, you get the tennis racket suit and think you were a tennis player <laughs> and then the winter come you would into everything but no it wasn't a, I couldn't really look at a sport and think I was I was really good at that you know mm-hmm. I, I just I tried all sorts but I wasn't very good at a lot of that you know and what about trips holidays as a kid where would be a big day out oh, or a, did you ever go away for a few days people to... wouldn't believe it but my ones was Peebles and Burnt Island occasionally Burnt Island mm-hmm. Peebles was the one if you went to Peebles you thought you were going abroad you know, it was like it was great though he's still because when you're younger your dad would say you know we're going to Peebles today to do some horse riding and Burnt Island for a wee break yeah, I can remember going to Blackpool once or twice which was like that was upmarket by then yeah. you know that was starting to as I get a bit older than that when we were younger we couldn't afford to go on shoes and I, could, mm-hmm. I think I could speak for most people you know at that days but I think they could have took you to the bottom of the road you yeah. know and you wouldn't have bothered you could have went as long as it was something that a wee was bit different, different a yeah. wee bit different you know yeah. if you'd been out for the, for the housing scheme but they were great but my mum and dad my dad tried you know they tried to give you the best that they could get as long as they 
seen that you were getting a wee holiday and you know you lit up and you seen something different they were they were more than happy with that but it was all doing to what they could afford at the yeah. time but they tried very very hard mm-hmm. to get us to enjoy the best we could you know it was Blackpool the shows and all that kind yeah of thing, the shows right? and all that type of stuff yeah we went down there a couple of times that was great you know you could imagine you're, you know when you're, you're walking in you see all these machines and you see mm-hmm. all that type of stuff the tower and huge but they're walking along Blackpool but that was a one off type thing for us even uh, staying in a hotel that's a kind of hotel, amazing yeah, experience that's right, but we it? never stayed at the caravans you know yeah. it was always caravans my dad had caravan a caravan so we'd go to we a caravan in Anstruther in Fife so we used to go there for some weekends as well so they did try but it was affordability but uh, they couldn't do everything for us but never seen a plane or anything like that you know mm-hmm. but it was, uh, to be honest going up to Princess Street was a was a day out for us for yeah. me you know getting a bus to Princess Street to afford it to go to Princess Street was a big thing for us you never seen Princess Street till I was about 15 or something 14 you know so but it never it never, it never bothered me I was happy with just jumping about my, my housing scheme you know and so primary school secondary school did you get into much trouble at school Mickey? no I wasn't I wasn't a troublemaker I'd maybe misbehave but I wasn't never a troublemaker I got a lot of values but I had a, a, a values for my dad you know and, and I was terrified of my dad my dad never hit me never hit me once but he would just warn you, you know, and I, he would just warn you and say, "Don't make sure you behave at school, and make sure you don't bring any trouble with us to the house." And it always stuck in my mind, you know. Anybody else, it didn't bother me, but I always used to think, "Oh, I don't worry, don't upset my dad," you know, because he'll be, he'll be angry. Mainly, I didn't know what to let him down. You know, it wasn't like you know I was feared them in terms of, "Oh, he's going to do this to me or that." My dad was simple. If you were misbehaving, you were just locked in the room, told, mm-hmm. "That's it. You're not going out with your friends." You're not flying your pigeons. You know, that was the type of stuff. You'll not get anything. And that's the way he treated us. And he said, you misbehave, everything will come away for you. So you never done it. But no, I wasn't there. I, I, was, I was a good person. I could have, you know, I had mm. opportunities. But then I did have a small spell when I stayed at the West Pilton at the time where I was running about with different types of people and we were getting into a bit, bit, bit of trouble. And that's where my dad and my granda got together to try and get my pigeon hut. Give me a focus. Because he'd obviously seen that I was doing things and I thought, well, you know, we need to do something about this. And they did. They gave me the hut and that was it. That was me. Once I had something to focus on, that was it. So I was quite good. I was quite good that way. And what secondary school were you at? I was at St Augustine's in, in Edinburgh. We a great school and great great class classmates were all good really good schooling wasn't the best at school you know mm. but I always attended I never skipped school or anything like that I always went but I wasn't the greatest there was a bit of a, I used to sit there, I remember used to sit there and oh, I thought about it was pigeons you know, <laughs> pigeons and football and so I wasn't a great attentive but but then I had a couple of teachers who really got to me and, and helped me they would say you know they could see I had a burning passion to be a football player you know yeah, but they had to realise that you know I had to do my schooling better so they helped me and they would give me a wee bit more time to practice because I remember I used to go at the gym after school and the PE teacher would allow me to go into there and the would sort of hockey nets were big at that time, you know, mm. hockey nets were... And you seen these hockey nets and you thought it was it was a dream, you know, a young yeah. boy, get somebody to go on goals and shooting into the hockey nets. But I had to earn the right to do that by knuckling down in class. And But I was a bit of a, a floater. My mind would float elsewhere, you know. I wasn't great at concentrating, you know, unless I really enjoyed it. If I really enjoyed it, then I would concentrate. History, I always liked history, these type of things. But once I didn't enjoy it, I would kind of switch off. It was the wrong thing to do, but that was just the way I was. And first romance at St Augustine's, Mickey? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, dear. I couldn't, I, I honestly could not. Not remember. Not even uh, one name. Not <laughs> one name. Uh, I think the one that I had a, a, a girlfriend, Julie, who went out for a wee while, and she got rid of me. And she was quite right to get rid of me. Uh, Too obsessed with pigeons. Too obsessed with pigeons and whatever. I was a wee bit older then, but as I say, I had so much things going on in my life. You know, I was a. Uh, I was always an outgoing person, eh? I was the one for just... But as I got older, obviously, when you get to, like, 15, 16, I started to like my music, going out with the boys up the town, that type of thing. But I was always focused on my football. I always knew, once I got a chance, that I've got to give it everything. You know, I'd take the best chance I could, mm. so... But I used to go out with my friends and that. Oh, I loved going mm. out on Saturday nights and, and sometimes Thursday nights. But I, I didn't drink, so that helped. I wasn't a drinker, I still don't drink to this day, so... I knew that I had a chance with that, but no, I enjoyed myself. I really enjoyed my friends going out with them and that, but always knew that I've I've got a career to look after, you know.
This is Life Stories with Easter Road legend Mickey Weir and we're just, we've just been going through Mickey's early life and now we're going to get straight into the football stuff at Porty Thistle. Mickey, when did you join Porty Thistle? Porty Thistle, I think I was round about 15, 16, Barry. I actually was playing with the school at the time. There's a long story towards that, which we'd, we'd be here all day, but uh, I kind of, the, lo- the clux of it was I gave the game up for a number of years because I'd been told I was too small to play, so... I don't want to bore you with all that stuff, but anyway, that that's what it basically happened. And then, uh, but where, so, where did that come from? Even just to go slightly into it, where did yeah, that come that from? Was that from, from a coach or it was from a, a club who told me? I won't like to mention who the club was, but anyway, numerous people. We were just numerous mm. people, and it, it kind of got in my head a wee bit, and I was devastated to be honest. Yeah. You know, so I said to my dad, you know, I'm I'm just going to fly my pigeons. You know, that's what it was like. There, I thought, nah, I've, I've had enough of it. I don't want that because it was, it was just broken hearted and that's why I've always been a bit wary of young people we were talking about your yeah, son last yeah. week there young boys going into the game and I, I just worry about the pitfalls you know yeah. what happens after that because mm. I suffered that you know yeah. and it put me off game for many years but anyway I gave the game up for maybe two three years so I what sort of age are you when you give up sorry uh, about 11 year old 11 right. 12 it wasn't a, I never started back playing football till I went to first year at school and one of my friends asked me it was a B team at St Augustine's and he said to me quite a good player Michael oh I know coming you know going to trials so I went to trials and I got into the team the B team and I quickly pro- progressed into the A team you know and which I always wind my, f- my pal up about that because he got me to go along and he got left in the B team <laughs> <laughs> he got left in the B team and I got moved up to the A yeah. team so I have a bit of a go around me yeah. but he was actually the one that they said to me why don't you come along so anyway I started to play with my school team on the wing straight away uh, no I was midfield player right. I started in the midfield in the middle and then yeah, a great man it was a, a great man by the name of Con Dugan who was uh, the football coach he was a he was a head teacher at St mm. Augustine's yeah. he was a great man big Celtic man he got me into the A team he was great for me Barry because mm. he was very straightforward you know he wanted you to be very disciplined he was all about behaving yourself you know I remember one of my first games for them they won the first or second game whatever it was and I played one game where I was the guy had a kick at me so I basically chased him out of the pitch for the, <laughs> for the next five minutes ten minutes and he had he pulled me in the uh, next again day and he said to me listen if if that's the way you're going to act then you can't play for my team you know you need to come away from that because I'm not you're not here to chase people about I'm not having that and it kind of shook me a wee bit you know he said because this school that's we we're, we're not about that we're about playing football. Play football, Michael. If you don't want to play football, then you'll not be playing for my team. So I thought, right, that's it. So I started to play with the A team. A very, very good side. We ended up winning a league, winning cups and whatever it may be. A lot of good players in the team. So then I got asked to go to Portobello Thistle, just out of the blue. Because in those days, Barry, you played with your school in the morning, as you know. Mm-hmm. And you played, yep. your, you could play jun- uh, federation football, it's called, in those days, in the afternoon. And it was a great man, George Johnson, who was so... Another one, I was very fortunate because I, I think a lot of it was because... I was no trouble, you know. I never, I wasn't. There was no baggage with me. You know, I was uh, quite easy to handle, to be honest. You know, because I was very quiet, very unassuming. I was a bit like that when I was younger. I was, uh, I wasn't the one for going out there and being, you know. So George asked me to come and play the Portobello Thistle. I went down there and I absolutely loved it. I would have, I would have run through brick walls for George Johnson. Yeah. I've, done anything for him because he gave me my chance you know he said come and play for me so I went to play with Porto Bill where was it was it Fishwives Causeway or was yeah it? it was it no it was down there we trained at Magdalene the sort of huts at and then the Thistle Foundation at one point and we sort of moved about but most mm. of the time my memories my greatest memories were mainly at the Thistle Foundation and then trained at Magdalene a school it was a hut so it's, I don't know if it's still there to be honest mm. I couldn't tell you but we trained around about that area but it was great we kind of moved about my memory isn't the greatest to be fair Barry mm. you know, but looking back but I just remember training there and they trained us hard you know it was Thursday night they absolutely ran the legs off Thursday night two mm. days before games ran you hard and then took you in the gym and gave you circuit training and you would play 3v3s in a wee tight gym 3v3s and that was that it was your training it was great it was very lucky I was very lucky I had good people like George and guys like Charlie who's a assist he helped them he'd done a lot of picking you up dropping them off that type of stuff mm-hmm. he helped me a lot as well Charlie Bull his name was he took me everywhere that type of thing so I was lucky were you they a good trainer ones. Mickey? 
Yeah, I love training. Yeah. I love training. I was. I'm still like that today. I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, I'll try to think I can train nowadays, but <laughs> I love training. That was one thing. I loved being fit. You know, I loved being fit, and in my mind, I always used to think it wasn't. It wasn't about being a professional football player or wanting to be a football player. I just loved to be fit. When I went to Porto Bella Thistle, we were a very, very fit side because they trained us hard. Trained us really hard. So. No, I, I, I was writing in my fitness bar, you know, I really liked being, it doesn't just happen, you know, people think, oh, well, you had talent, but yeah, you had talent in that, but I worked hard, I used to run the streets of Clermeson, when I come home from school at night, I'd run every night, you know, and practice with the ball every night, in the summertime, so I just loved it, I just mm. loved it, it wasn't like, a, oh, I want to be a football player, yeah. not at all, I just wanted to be the best I could be, so that was my early memories, of it. but I loved it, put it belt thistle, loved it. Yeah. And so, when was the approach from Hibs then? Were you still at Portie Thistle at the time? I was at Portie Bell Thistle, yeah, and it was a... Uh, my brother could tell the story great better than me, to be honest, but it was a... Uh, I got offered to play in a, a one-off practice match at Easter Road, and it was a... Uh, I think it was Edinburgh Schoolboys against a sort of mixed mash of players, you know? So we played at Easter Road, and one off and you could imagine I'm a hip supporter you know <laughs> my dad I've got, I've got a call he come would you like to come and play it was a, it was this uh, old scout Jim McManus who was a scout at Hibs we're having a trial game at Easter Road and my dad went yeah so went along there and I remember I had my family in the stand I was just kind of just a young boy though but I never ever worried about that I just went and played football so I went out and I played 11 v 11 practice match type thing and obviously did okay can't remember anything about the game at all but <laughs> just to play in Easter Road was massive yeah. for me as a young boy you know and looking up and thinking my goodness you know this is what it's all about sort of thing and then the next again I think it was maybe a week two three days later on I got a call from Paddy Stanton who's the manager to would like to come and talk to your dad and whatever so he went in and he offered me a contract could you believe it just right out of the blue but he did say to me you know you've got a bit of fight in your hands with your size and things mm-hmm. like that but ability will overcome that we think that ability to overcome that but you need to work hard which I did but I thought well this is my chance you know I'm going to go and give it everything I could and I did for an early age that's brilliant you've been contacted by the actual manager ah, as was well, unbelievable. You know, we could imagine my dad my dad's hero was Paddy Stanton you know so yeah. one of them he loved Paddy Stanton so pff, my dad's gone in to meet Pat Stanton you know I suppose it happens nowadays to be mm. managers you know but I think there's still was, a lot of layers now though you know so the, the club has to officially get in touch with the boys club first before yeah. they can approach the parents and that kind of thing but yeah, as in those uh, days you could just go no, direct just a matter of quick phone call come in obviously they had to get in contact with Portobello Thistle very much like that but George and that were great for they, they loved it they wanted players anybody to go and play professional for a club that because you've got to remember we talked about federation I think there was a difference between federation and juvenile Yeah, you know yeah. federation clubs were sort of lower scale you know for me to get a chance they were over the moon for me no that's brilliant and what, what are your earliest memories of your time at Easter Road what, what age are you then so I take it you've, you've left you, 16, have, you left, have you left school as soon as you've been offered yeah, the contract or I left school when I worked I left school when I worked for I worked in a hotel for about a week <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I didn't. That was the way I was, Barry. You know, I wanted to get out and work. You know, so my dad. Well, it was my dad said to me, "Now we've left school. It's time to get a job." So I went and I worked in a hotel, the one right next to the train station. I went in there. I worked. I was cleaning pots and pans and all that kind of stuff. But I would have done it. It didn't bother me one little bit. I just went. There, I thought, well, I've got to work. But that was the way it was. My dad always drilled it in me. You need to work, and I enjoyed it for. for I think it was about a week or something mm-hmm. like that. But I remember just, you know, cleaning all the pots and pans. It mm. took you hours, and these days you never had. It yeah. was just hot water, you know, and a yeah. bit of this and whatever. But I thought it was great. I thought it was great because I'm thinking, this is great, I'm working now, you know, and whatever yeah. it was. But I was, I was only a matter of weeks, if you're lucky, and then obviously when I got offered the contract, I could go into full time, you know. I went in because in those days it was a YTS. You had to work for a wee while first and then YTS would kick in, sort of thing. So it was maybe two weeks of this hotel before I actually joined the Hibs, that type of thing. That's good, though. There's a lot of today's players could do with a couple of weeks of washing pots and pans, I think. Oh, no. I was, as I say, I was, ne- I was never one for... I knew from day one that it's all about hard work. You know, it's all about doing mm. the best you can. But that never bothered me Barry I always had the hunger in me to, to work you know to, and still like that today uh, if I get a couple of days off I'm bored I get bored very quickly I'm, I've got to be doing something you know so I was yeah. like that when I was young so you signed for your boyhood heroes and you're an apprentice what, what are the jobs of an apprentice then in those oh, days what did you have you to do you a dog's body you've done everything everything you clean boots 
he started with my baby. People think, oh, I was seven till twelve. No, for a for a young boy, it wasn't it. Half past seven, I was in Easter Road, maybe quarter to eight. I'd be there till maybe six o'clock at night. So you would do your get in the morning, you do all the boots for the first team, get the boots ready for the first team, get all the kit ready. Then you would go, you'd train. If you're lucky, sometimes you didn't train. Sometimes you would tell you go and paint the stand or whatever it was. Then you would get come back for training. You would have to do all the boots again, clean all the boots, get all the kit ready for the next again day. Then go out and do the terrace in, clean the terrace in, sweep the kit terrace in every single day. And it was hard, hard work, Barry. It was hard work. That must be been heartbreaking when you don't even get any game, any training. Sometimes nothing. you never got any training. It's yeah. true, you were just in there. And if it was something to be done, oh, the young boys will do it. You know, yeah. we just done everything. And But it was a character building as well. And not just that, I think a lot of it was, I think the managers in that looked at you and seen, can, can he handle this? And it was always like, a, I always felt that they were watching you to see if your character could stand up to it. Didn't it bother me one little bit. I was yeah. willing to work. I was willing to work. It didn't bother me. And was there a youth team at that point, or was it reserves in the first team? Reserves, and that was it. Reserves in first team. It was a. Uh, and I think, as I said to you, I think it was the biggest detriment of Scottish football is being a loss of the reserve team because we never had seventeens against seventeens and eighteens, mm. and it doesn't work, Barry. And we were just. You had to become a man quickly. You were seventeen year old. You had to sink or swim. You had to go in the reserves, and you had to show up. With that, you had a lot of good, experienced players around about you who would give you a lot of grief. You know, a lot of hard. It was a hard school. Very hard school. Boys, if you didn't play well, they would tell you. And if you made a bad pass, they would tell you. If you ran, if you maybe hold on to the ball too long, it was just a hard, hard school. But a great learning. You know, if you look at all the players that come through from my era, even at your hearts, your Gary McKay's, your John Robertson's, myself, Paul Kane, John Collins, lists endless, you know. And yeah. it was all because you were in a, a level where you're playing against men. You're not playing against 17 year olds, you're playing mm. against seasoned professionals who taught you the game and, and you you couldn't step out of line with these boys these guys had been there done it you had to listen to them if you didn't listen to them you wouldn't go far in the game of football so it was hard school but that was the way you were brought up you know that was the way mm-hmm. it was then there was no you had to go right in there sink or swim that's yeah. what it was you know. so how soon after starting the apprenticeship were you on the pitch for the reserves was it pretty much oh, straight, right, away? straight away yeah. yeah straight away one of my first games I think if maybe the first game played against Aberdeen I was speaking to someone about that last week there Aberdeen and we lost 7 nothing. I remember going home that night thinking my career's over I'm not going to be good enough I was only a young man, but I was playing against a midfield of Andy Watson, Drew McMaster, Gordon Strachan, eh, who was the other one? Four, and obviously centre-backs who had played at the top level, and they were getting ready for a European tie the week after, so they were all wanting to get in the team. So they were flying, you know, and they absolutely battered us, and mm. they've got a touch of the ball. It was virtually men against boys, you know. But I remember having a meeting in Pakistan and pulled us so on and said, no, listen, forget about it. That's, you're playing against where you need to be. Mm. That's what it's all about. That's the, You're playing where you need to be now. You need to learn about losing and about winning and that type of thing. But really, I was devastated by it. I thought, I've got a long, long way to go. But therefore, then fast forward a year a bit later, we went up to Aberdeen and beat them 7 nothing in their own ground, which was unheard of. Alex Ferguson was the manager. We went up there, but... We, We'd all grown, got a bit mm. more experience, you know. Maybe we about a year and a year bit later anyway. Uh, but myself and Paul Kane, I keep talking about it, but we went up there and beat them seven in our own ground. It was unheard of. But we had a lot of good players on that side because they had all matured experiences and you learn more from losing, you know. You learn more yeah. from losing. It's your character. You build the either, you say, well, this is tough, but I'm going to get through this, you know. Mm. And I think all young people need that, you know. They all need it to get through it. Some of them can't handle it. Some of them, they lose and they just get devastated. And, it, and they just think, they find excuses. You know, I still see it now with young boys. They find the excuses. We got, if they get beat, they think, oh, well, I'm not playing next week. You know, that tough. It wasn't like that in those days. You had to tough up. You had to just go, right, got beat. Let's get back. Let's get back on it. And how long, I suppose that was the, the disappointment against Aberdeen, after that, I mean, when did you realise how good you were or how good you could be? I never I, I never really looked at it that way. I just kept plugging away, playing away, and I had a lot of disappointments through it. It wasn't it just didn't just happen, you know. I yeah. had a lot of disappointments uh, when I was younger because you had to, every week you were always 
I always felt it was either a, a, a fight in my hands, you know, mm-hmm. because of my stature. So every week was difficult. Who was but on the, the wing in the first team at that point? Oh, it was a lot of good players at that time. Different players, you know, boys like Gary Murray, Ralph Callaghan. A lot of good players, you know, mm-hmm. but I was never, I wasn't quite ready for it, which I knew. But it's hard to tell someone that, you know, you, you, I was itching to get in, but I was only worried about my next contract. I always yeah. thought to myself, I don't want to get released. I want to make sure we don't get released, you know, and then you've got a chance. How long was that first deal then? My first year was two year contract. It was a two year contract, so it brought me up to about 18, sort of thing, you know, just after 18. But I got in the first team just before that. I got asked to play in a reserve game at Airdrie, believe it or not. I got asked. That was a strange story, but anyway, I got in there, and John Blackley asked me if I could play a left back, and I said, Yeah, I'll play. You know, I wasn't going to turn it down. He says, yeah, I'll play, left back. Yeah. So he played me at left back. And, uh, <laughs> so the first time you pulled on the green and white strip yeah, for the first team, left, left back. Left back, yeah. <laughs> People wouldn't believe that, but that's what happened. And then How did you get on at left back? I must have done okay. Mm. I must have done okay. John Blackley played me at left back a few times, and then he played me in the first team at left back. But I had a disaster. I played against Dundee, and uh, I knew myself, Barry, this is not my position, you know, but... I would just want to play with the first team. I wouldn't yeah. care if they put me in goals. I would have went in goals because I wanted to play for Hibs. So we played Dundee and I think it was a Scottish Cup tie and uh, that was the end of my career. <laughs> left back because <laughs> Big John Brown, he out jumped me for a co- at the back post. But she was a big lad, you know, mm. and it was a diagonal cross and I, I knew, oh, and he got and he scored and John Blackley absolutely destroyed me after the game you know and I mm. thought well I knew then that I wasn't going to be a left back but yeah. you just take what you can you know and so when did they start playing you in your preferred position in the first team how well, long after that was Paddy it Paddy Stanton put me in at midfield he played me against Dumbarton which was a sort of relegation battle you know and myself I think Paul Keane and that played in that game I'm not right I should but he pulled me in and said right virtually put all us in all the young boys in put you in says right we were struggling at the time so he played me at Dumbarton against Dumbarton at home centre midfield you know, because that's where I played. Uh, well, he seen me playing there. And thought, right, put me in there, and that was the start of it. You know, it was tough. We lost the game. I lost the game. Paddy Stanton resigned after the game, so he must have seen something. He must have thought, well, they're not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so he he resigned after the game, and that was a big loss. That was a big hit mm. for me. So I'm thinking, I was used to Pat, you know, and encouragement. Yeah. Pat always encouraged, which all the coaches did. So when he lost the door, oh, I was devastated, and then you're thinking, well, what what next? You know. Mm-hmm. But then John Blackley took the job on and John gave me a, a fair wee bit of it. But then I started to suffer with injury. Got a took glandular fever, which put me out of the game for nearly a year. So I struggled. I struggled really time, bad times and that was a real tough time for me because I'm thinking, I couldn't I couldn't really get a run of games, you know. I couldn't yeah. get a run of games. I started getting problems with my back and I couldn't get a run of games. So I think to myself, I'm, I'm in real trouble here. So John Blackley played me a few games and then he kind of put me in the reserves a wee bit it was a bit of both you know in and out yeah. but I took glandular fever and that was the worst time that was horrendous because I had to just give it up for about near enough a season without the game and I'm thinking to myself and then John Blackley lost his job and I'm thinking oh this is it this is and Alec Muller came in as a manager and I'm thinking I, had, I couldn't show him what I could do you know because yeah. I'm thinking I've not played so and he, he took me in the office and said to me you know right this is the way it is well I'll put you in month-to-month contracts. I like you. I've seen you playing in the reserves, I think, but I think I've got a position for you that will suit you. I'll put you in month-to-month contracts and it's up to yourself to show that you can... But we'll give you a chance to recover because I was really weak, Barry. I had no strength. I'd lost everything. I went down to like seven, six, seven stone, you know, really bad. Anyway, so I built my strength up. I gave him a wee chance. Once I got my strength back... Then I started to do well. Obviously, he moved me, put me into the first team. So that was the start of it. Put me in, a, I think it was a two-year contract or whatever it was. And that was me away and, away and playing again. Alec Miller's obviously a, a fan and that's gone well. How did you end up at Luton then? How did that all well, come I did, about? Well, I, I, I started to do really well. But what, I mean, what are the happiest memories of that first spell at Hibs? Let's maybe do that first. Oh, they're so. great. It was great. It was great because I was a young man playing with the Hibs, you know, playing in local derbies against the Hearts, that type of thing, which was big for us. But I really really just wanted to play one game for the Hibs. One game yeah. would have done me, you know, because I would have said, well, I've played for the Hibs, you know. But it was great and for some reason early on the supporters were great with me and it was great you know but it, it, well, your whole life changes Barry you know because I was used to as I say I wasn't a, I wasn't a drinker or anything like that I wouldn't go up with tune or anything like that I just kept myself myself and played mm-hmm. my football and, but then when I started to go up 
out with my friends, I realised that, oh, this is this is tough, you know, because you're getting recognised and people are giving you abuse on the street and uh, that type of stuff. And it really came to my head where uh, one of my cars was, I was just got badly smashed up, basically, and painting that thrown over and that. And I kind of took it the wrong way, which I did, and I thought to myself, you know, I don't want this, I didn't need this. I got angry, that, that angry that... At that time, there was, was a few clubs that were kind of interested in me, and I jumped. I thought, yeah, no, that was the real reason. People say that the real, the real reason was I was just getting fed up with getting abuse in the streets and abuse in the everywhere I went, everywhere. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I felt like it was like public enemy number one, you know. Was, even in Leith, even yeah, in your... oh, everywhere, everywhere I went. Not so much in Leith because I didn't, I didn't go into Leith much, but anywhere up the town, it just become hard for me, you know. And but the car situation, I got a new car and I done it again, and it was just becoming unbearable at times you know I thought nah so this uh, stupidly this I got a contact from someone about looting and uh, I went yeah I'm going to go for it which was stupidly it was just mm-hmm. a young man I was very you know I thought to myself I'll have a go I'll give it a go because I just really got annoyed really yeah. it, was, it was annoyed you know and I just moved so I went I signed for looting took a lot of abuse for it and rightly so because his supporters were, were tough with me but they didn't know a lot of the stuff that was going on in the background you know so they kind of got annoyed with me for a wee while and I thought well and I could understandable, you know. So I ended up down in Luton for a, a short spell, and never lasted long. On that brutal plastic that pitch. That brutal plastic pitch, which was the biggest vein of my life. That's the biggest mistake of my life. Was no playing at Luton because I enjoyed the club. I loved mm-hmm. it, but the, the AstroTurf was just an absolute nightmare. And it just I knew after about two or three sessions that I was struggling. My knees were struggling. My back was struggling. And I thought, oh, I can't keep going on like this, you know. Yeah, because the first generation stuff was like playing on a rock hard playground, oh, it was, wasn't it? It was terrible people wouldn't believe it it was good enough to pl- train on and that you know they mm. thought but I used to go home in pieces you know and I was like no this is no and then I started to one thing led to another I started to get a bit homesick because of that but it was just all general root of my mood of having to get injured you know feeling my back all the time and I just mm-hmm. I just got annoyed at it just much the same I thought no I'm not having this so I uh, made contact to try and get a move back up to Hibs and uh, come back to the club yeah but come back to Hibs and we're going to have a bit more of a chat about that second glorious spell this is Life Stories with Mickey Weir here on Thelma FM and Mickey Weir's story does indeed continue in part two of this episode of Life Story available on Libsyn and on Spotify If you have enjoyed this podcast, we have others. Just pop along to our website, www.livingmemory.org.uk and follow the link on our homepage. You can also learn more about our work or trawl through our photo archive. We have over 3,500 photos for you to look at. Check us out on Facebook under Living Memory Association or for podcasts, Thelma FM. We also have a Twitter account. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy our other content.